Hey guys, Budcat7 here. Okay, it is Thursday, January 13th, 2022. And I'd like to thank you for visiting the Stonewall Research Channel here on YouTube. I really do appreciate it. Okay guys, well, I thought at the beginning of the year here, we'd go over some of the topics on my channel that I cover, which are sort of in a way very avant-garde or very um, extreme and offbeat even by alternative standards although to me they make perfect sense from any sort of scientific standpoint but I want to cover these topics because these are the things I like to talk about on my channel sort of ideas and things that are different than anything you've ever heard before and they're not my ideas you know they're ideas that other people have introduced into these topics but don't seem to be covered by any sort of mainstream or alternative um, you know writers or pundits or whatever they are um, and I just wonder why, you know, because the idea seems to be very interesting to me, and I don't see why these things can't be explored. They have equal validity when you're sort of supposing at things that probably can't ever be really known, not without a whole lot of research and tools, maybe, but To illustrate what I'm talking about and what this video is really about, I was just watching a little bit of this science fiction show called Threshold about this team of people gathered by the government to investigate UFO phenomena, whatever it is. And, you know, I watched a little bit of it. Because these are the things that are thrown my way. Obviously, the um, the artificial intelligence knows what I'm going to be doing on Wednesday nights and Monday nights when I'm trying to do some research and trying to produce my videos and everything. So they throw these things at me. And, you know, so anyway, I'm watching the thing. And what is it about? Well, it's about this sort of crystalline energy being not a UFO spaceship or spacecraft, but this sort of crystalline energy being, you know, I can only think of some other science fiction series that I've seen with other sort of similar creatures or entities, whatever it might be, sort of, you know, intelligent entities. And it's almost like a bit of a truth drop here, I think, because it's not a spaceship. It's some sort of creature, you know, which uh, kills all these people and everything. Of course, it's malevolent. And, you know, that's a bit of a truth drop in a way, too. But from, you know, the standpoint that I'm looking at it from, it's not that they're malevolent or not. It's just that they're creatures and, you know, predatory creatures, at least some of them are, and, you know, they're going to have the mindset and mentality of predatory creatures, not particularly malevolent or not, except that they want to hunt you down and, you know, do whatever they're going to do with you, chew you up, play with you, whatever, like a cat, something like that, but, you know, if you're just a new viewer coming to my channel here, a new subscriber, you know, just coming across this video or anything, I mean, these are not my ideas, and, you know, I was always interested in the UFO phenomena, sort of, you know, casual interest in it, of course, you know, I didn't go hog wild and crazy about it and read everything I ever could about it, but, you know, I saw and read many things, you know, back in the days when there wasn't a lot of TV, and, you know, you had to read more stuff and whatnot, but magazines and whatever it was. So, you know, I was always casually interested in UFO phenomena, but I came across whether it was introduced when I was 
looking into um, Wilhelm Reich, which is what this article on Wikipedia is about. I just sort of came down here and got this UFOs and Wilhelm Reich and why he was interested in it. And I found it very interesting. And who would be associated with Wilhelm Reich? Well, that would be Trevor James Constable from this article in Wikipedia here. But I'd like to read it to you because... You know, this is one of the things that Reich had been focused on. I mean, he's an extremely intelligent guy, genius-level guy. Why was he obsessed with these ideas? Well, probably not for no reason, probably for some reason. You know, some people think crazy reasons or whatever, but was he so crazy? Well, Constable didn't seem to think so. And there's a handful of researchers who follow this thread, but to me, and... You know, what I'm proposing here on my channel, what's going to follow in those footsteps is that, you know, I just think, you know, that this is something that's, you know, being suppressed for some reason, you know, either, you know, by the UFO community and, you know, they don't talk about it. It's obviously part of the UFO lore because it goes all the way back in time you know, to the early times, you know, of sort of modern era UFO phenomena. So I don't understand why this aspect of it isn't explored more, including a lot of, you know, sort of photographs and things you've seen on the internet of some of these things you see in the sky that look very much like, more like creatures and less like spaceships. But can I, if I can read this to you, let me, let me do it because, you know, this is where I get my ideas from. It's not my own original idea or anything, but... Okay, so it says here in this Wikipedia article a part about UFOs and Wilhelm Reich. According to Turner, which I guess is somebody who studies Reich, the injunction triggered a further deterioration of... Reich's mental health from at least, because, you know, I have to say the guy is crazy because, you know, of course, the mainstream denial of UFOs and, you know, anything else would be considered alternative, especially back then. From at least early 1954, he came to believe that the planet was under attack by UFOs, which he called, quote-unquote, energy alphas. It's just interesting, you know, I have to look at it, anybody who's ever studied psychology, or if you haven't, but you have to look at it from, you know, how people have, how they picture things in their mind, and why would they do that? And, you know, it's interesting to sort of ponder those questions, but why, why do people say the things that they do, and why do they classify the things they do in the way that they do? But he called them energy alphas, which I find very interesting if they are living creatures. So he said he often saw them flying over Oregon, which was what he called his place where he worked and studied and lived. Shaped like thin cigars with windows, leaving streams of black, deadly orgone radiation in their wake, which he believed the aliens were scattering to destroy the Earth. So it's somewhat paranoid view of the UFO phenomena and what they were doing. He and his son would spend their nights searching for UFOs through telescopes and binoculars, and when they believed they had found one, would roll out the cloud buster to suck the energy out of it, which is this device that he developed. It looked like a cannon with a lot of hollow tubes, which, you know, I don't know the particulars of the technology, actually, but it's interesting what's being said here. Wright claimed he had shot several of them down. Armed with two cloud buses, they fought what, what Wright called a quote-unquote full-scale full interplanetary battle in Arizona, where he had rented a house as a base station. In Contact with Space, 1956, he wrote of the 
quote unquote, very remote possibility that his own father had been from outer space. So, you know, well, Reich was, you know, trying to collect his thoughts on just basically a rather new phenomena, and even at that time, and in 1947 was Roswell, right, and uh, the, the spotting of the um, flying discs there in Washington State or Alaska, wherever it was there, um, related to a case I want to talk about, but So he didn't start talking about his affairs with other people. It has nothing to do with UFOs whatsoever. So this is a bit of propaganda here. From what I understand about Reich was that he believed that these things were emitting this sort of energy or whatever sort of energy beings of some sort. And this is what Trevor James Constable picked up from. And this is what really interest me about what he thought they were and I thought maybe it's because he wrote about fighter aces in World War II. He's had one of his friends and co-authors was one American fighter pilot and they wrote about fighter aces and he got a lot of bad sort of press on it because they sort of glorified these Nazi World War II Nazi you know, fighter aces, and of course the Jewish community did not like that, and of course they're going to, you know, do everything in their power to sort of, you know, criticize it and, you know, get rid of it, but I thought he might be thinking about, you know, all these fighter pilots and other pilots in World War II certainly report about these foo fighters, these sort of glowing orbs, which had, you know, I thought maybe could be sort of a energy trace from a parallel universe or something like that, you know, so going through the same motions in a parallel universe that was very close to ours, let's say, and it's just sort of a shadow, energy shadow or something like that coming, emulating from this parallel universe, but it could very well be these UFOs because one of the profile points of the UFOs is the ability to camouflage themselves, you know. And another interesting, I was just watching with, you know, the 411, missing 411 from Dave Politis and Can Am Missing Project. I don't, <clears throat> I've never heard anybody write into him at all about this aspect of the UFO phenomena that these things are actually creatures and not spacecraft or spaceships and nobody's ever written to him about it at all and i've been meaning to do it for a long time i just don't have a lot of time is my main problem but i want to take some time to write him about it because he's not considering it from this aspect it's not mine again it's just people like constable and uh, right, that put these ideas out. So, let me read to you what it says about Constable here, is where I sort of get my thoughts from because I thought this was a very interesting concept. And when I thought about the reports that I had heard already about the UFO phenomenon, I was saying to myself, you know, that's very interesting that it's, this is what's being said because. It seemed to me that some of these UFO reports, these things were exhibiting some sort of animal behavior. And I mean, I was an avid fan of, you know, Star Trek and all these science fiction, Star Wars, whatever things, creatures that live in space is not like a new or crazy idea or anything like that, you know pretty common one in the sci-fi realm, at least, you know, into the fantasy realm, fiction realm. But this is never applied to, you know, the kind of UFO um, reporting and dramatizations that are done, like on the History Channel and Ancient Aliens and all this kind of stuff. 
could very well, you know, human beings could still have the same mindset as the people in the past. They just they don't know what to make of these things, so they should make up all kinds of stories and their own depictions. But these things, I think, are able to get inside our minds. And I'm not, again, I'm not the guy who originally thought this at all was another researcher you can hardly find these guys and you know they're just this whole idea is being suppressed but let me read to you what it says in constables paid you know part of his page here on wikipedia the baloney online encyclopedia <coughs> after reading about radionics and wilhelm reich's orgone the constable became convinced that supposed ufos were in fact living organisms he set out to prove his theory by taking a camera with him fitted with an ultraviolet lens and high-speed film the process pictures pictured showed signs of discoloration which constable insisted were proof of amoeba like animals inhabiting the sky now i certainly could entertain this possibility because there probably are creatures that are transparent that live in our atmosphere and certainly a possibility of it seems you know more likely than not and who's to say these things are carbon-based life forms either you know but some other different kind of life form that we just don't know about but Constable kept on getting these things, which they call these discolorations, whatever these blobs in the atmosphere, it's just a different class of atmospheric organisms, and that's not an unusual idea. There's even modern day science, and everybody proposes all the creatures that could be living in the atmospheres of other moons, of other planets within our solar system, etc., etc. So it's not a weird idea at all. And why couldn't it be happening here? Well, it certainly could be. It's just, you know, nobody cares to look into it. And maybe for good reason it could be that the government knows exactly, and I believe this, and I presented it that way on my channel here, that they know all about UFOs and that they're living creatures and that they're not spacecraft or spaceships or anything like that. They know all about it. And at Roswell, you know, they had to give some kind of story over there, and they gave the cover story there, which everybody believes today, but in fact, what they have is one of these organisms, and they try to dissect it and try to understand, you know, how it worked. But they really couldn't figure it out. <clears throat> they can't figure out how our own brains work. How are they going to figure out how some alien brain works? So, so he thought they were living organisms. Reviewing his newfound evidence, Constable was moved to write in two books that the creatures, though not existing outside the infrared range of the electromagnetic spectrum, quote-unquote, had been on this earth since it was more gaseous than solid. He claimed that the creatures belonged to a new offshoot of evolution and that the species should be classified under macrobacteria. According to Consul, the creatures could be the size of a coin or as large as a half a mile across or even bigger. And in my opinion, these things are all creatures and the ones that we're talking about with the hard shells are more like insects or some sort of crustacean sea creature they seem to be at home in the sea just as well as they are in space i think that you know the most energy that they expend is in our atmosphere whereas in space they don't have to expend so much energy <clears throat> and you know could anything live in space well we'll look into that too and, you know, some of these smaller ones, I think there's a whole lot of different species of these things that probably inhabit the whole universe. And maybe some of them originated here. Maybe all of them originated here. How do we know how old the Earth is and everything? They don't know. They can't date rocks and everything. It's all bullshit. Okay. 
like people at Thunderbolts Project seem to think that it's all this nonsense, arbitrary numbers that they give, and the universe is as old as as old could possibly be. They can imagine, didn't, there's no Big Bang and all this kind of stuff. They don't believe that at Thunderbolts. They believe that's a Maloney story. The biology of the creatures supposedly meant that they were visible radar, even when not to the naked eye, to explain supposed cattle and occasionally human mutilations. Constable theorized that the use of radar angered the organisms who would become predatory when provoked. At a later date, a cryptozoologist officially classified these supposed creatures as amoebae, amoebae constablia, named after their discoverer. Constable wrote a book entitled The Cosmic Pulse of Life in 1975 that outlined his ideas, but his original book was called They Live in the Sky. I've shown it before on this channel many times. And they show this sort of thing that looks like a UFO, but it's a creature. Okay, so why does this seem more plausible than anything else well if you look at some of the creatures right here on earth and how amazing they are and they just are so much more amazing than we are and more evolved to their specific niche in their environment that it really it makes us seem like nothing really a lot of times but We'll take a look at some of that stuff, too. So, he wrote these books, and I've read a bit of both of them, both of those books, and he says that they're living creatures, and that's what I say, okay, where he says a couple of things in here where I could expound upon, well, these things are just expert um, at camouflage, and have all kinds of light receptors, you know, they're, who knows, they're probably not carbon-based life forms, or if they are, just put together in a way that we can't possibly understand, yeah, you know, they generate their own energy, they can travel at these incredible speeds, you know, what are they consuming, and again, you know, one of these reports... which was the Maury Island incident, which they hardly do it justice here in the Wikipedia article. But it says here, the initial story here, <coughs> Arnold was the guy who originally saw the saucers when he was traveling in his plane off there in the Rockies, I believe, in the West Coast. He was the original guy, so he interviewed this guy who gave another report there in 1947, very early in the sort of modern-day UFO folklore. And here's what, it, what happened. On June 21st, 1947, in the afternoon, about 2 o'clock, I was patrolling the East Bay of Maury Island as I, as captain, was steering my patrol boat close to the shore of a bay on Maury Island. On board were two crewmen, my 15-year-old son and his dog. As I looked up from the wheel on my boat, I noticed six very large donut-shaped aircraft. <clears throat> Dahl further claimed that one of the objects began, quote, began spewing forth what seemed like thousands of newspapers from somewhere on the inside of its center. These newspapers, which turned out to be a white type of very lightweight white weight material, flooded to earth, unquote. Dahl reported that a substance resembling lava rocks fell onto their boat, breaking a worker's arm and killing a dog. So it broke his son's arm and killed the dog this slag that came out of these, did one of these things. Okay, so here's where the, you know, men in black coming from to the war of that. Dahl said his superior officer, Fred Crisman, investigated. Dahl also claimed he was later approached by a man in a dark suit and told not to talk about the incident. Crisman, when interviewed, reported having recovered debris from Maury Island and having witnessed an unusual craft. <clears throat> okay, so this is one of the reports that, in my mind, when I recalled it after knowing about Constable and Wright, when I recalled it and I said to myself, these things was exhibiting, these things were exhibiting some sort of 
animal behavior, some sort of herd behavior. It seems to me that one of these things, this one thing, was either ill or sick. These other ones were with it for protection as it was having its episode there, whatever malady it was suffering from. It defecated or got rid of waste or whatever it is. These things have their own built-in star drives. Whatever they're consuming, they're consuming whatever it is, raw materials or whatever it is here on Earth. They're silicon-based life forms, possibly. And silicon-based life forms would probably defecate some sort of slag, wouldn't you think? <clears throat> so, you know, to me, this, this report shows how these things are behaving in sort of herd mentality behavior, protecting one of their own that are, is weak, at least in this type of, you know, creatures with, sentient creatures with, you know, very intelligent ones. And our concept of intelligence really has to be revised, and it is under advisement when they find out how intelligent the creatures right here on this planet are. And... If you don't think the creatures on this planet are amazing, just, I always refer to, and I like referring to, um, Moya on Farscape. I like this one of it. It sort of gives a detailed look of, you know, what's going on in different areas of the, of the quote-unquote ship, which Moya from the science fiction show Farscape, back, I guess, in the 90s, 2000s, whatever it was. And she's a living ship, okay, spaceship. Okay, here's a concept. It's not a new concept. It's a concept from the show. It's just interesting how this looks here. And I point out the midshipman fish here. Here's the midshipman fish, a very unusual sort of uh, prehistoric type fish, but has this bioluminescence that makes it look like this, okay? But with the UFO phenomena and what these creatures are, you combine all the elements of bioluminescence, bioelectric, and biomechanics that are incorporated into these things to create them, okay? And their movements, etc., etc. So, this just sort of suggests to me, and, you know, I always think, you know, I hear all these reports from MUFON and Peter Davenport and on Coast to Coast and on YouTube and Beyond Creepy and David Politis even gets into it a little bit. And I'm always yelling at the computer here that these things are exhibiting sort of animal behavior. Even some organization down in South America did an evaluation of missing 4114 David Politis and said that these things were exhibiting sort of predatory behavior. Okay, so it's interesting to me what it is that exists in people's minds that are thinking about these things and along these lines. And if you talk about living creatures in space, they found out that this water bear, so it's one of the creatures from our planet, somehow was in space they found it on uh, the space station they found other organisms on the space station and how did they get there see this one says astronauts find living organisms well apparently this water bear can survive in space this is what the first thing you're going to come to but then you'll have other articles about it like this one like what is this what they call zeroids. Okay. 
zero on these living space creatures. There's somebody talking on this blog spot about zeroids, living beings which inhabit the cosmic void, bioforms which may populate the recesses of free space. <laughs> this domain is characterized by virtually zero temperature and zero atmospheric pressure. Russian astrophysicist Dr. V. I. Goldansky argued that appreciable quantities of prebiotic material should be able to accumulate in the regions surrounding nebula or titanic gas clouds. Already dozens of organic compounds have been identified in space, including formaldehyde, prussic acid, and cellulose. In short, there is an abundance of basic building blocks out there to allow for the evolution of zeroids. <clears throat> and here they show some pictures of some weird stuff photographed in our skies. What are these things? And do they look like spacecraft? But the thing about it, and I've tried to demonstrate on the channel, that some of these things look like similar to living organisms that we have on our planet that look like machines like some of these single cell organisms that also have like built-in machinery in them that occurs naturally they have gears in them how does that occur naturally it's just amazing Zeroids may range in dimensionally from the microscopic to the macroscopic, and they vary from the utterly simple to the extraordinarily complex, and they may live singly or in vast colonies. I guess saying maybe this thing is some sort of colony here, and some photographs of something found in space there. <laughs> Zeroids may have migrated to all sectors of space, both within and without galaxies. Endowed with both mobility and intelligence, it is conceivable that some may have actually penetrated our zone of existence. Atmospheric friction might parboil some zeroids to cinders, and our planet's gases and temperature might prove lethal to still others. What are these things here? Um, space. Yet some may have evolved a protective shield, either physical or electromagnetic in nature, that has enabled them to survive entry into our, our domain. Here is evidence video from NASA, life zeroids, extremophiles can survive in outer space. <clears throat> and I think they talked about this water bear in there, and we don't have to get into it. If you want to watch it, you can certainly have it. And they took this other video down of zeroids and other strange space anomalies. There's sort of a, <clears throat> from what I understand, some section of the um, of space where they look into it with a telescope, like the Hubble telescope, where there's just this green glob, and they don't know what it is somewhere in space. And, you know, who knows, it would be huge masses of bioforms in space. So let me read this article to you from how things work, how stuff works, and what they say in here. In the late 1940s and 1950s, some theorists thought flying saucers might be space animals. The first to suggest this idea, however, was Charles Fort in his 1931 book, Low, where he speculated that unknown objects in the sky could be, quote, living things that occasionally come from somewhere else, unquote. A few days after Kenneth Arnold's sighting on June 24th, 1947, the guy who interviewed the guy with a Maury Island sighting, that's Kenneth Arnold, <coughs> John Philip Besser wrote the Air Force to tell it what the flying disks were, a, quote, form of space animal, unquote, propelled by quote-unquote telekinetic energy, okay? These creatures might be carnivorous, which I think they are, and I think that's what 
the politest has on his hands that nobody's ever written to him about, nobody's ever talked about, nobody from the UFO community has ever talked about it with him, and why not? What's the problem? It's not an original idea of mine, or even anybody writing these articles here, you know? Many, quote, many falls of flesh and blood from the sky in times past, unquote, he declared, could be the leftover remains of unfortunate persons eaten by hungry UFOs. How interesting that he said this, and mutilations, etc. In 1955, Countess Joey Wasilko Sarecki theorized that UFOs were, quote, vast luminous bladders of colloidal silicones, unquote, silicon based life forms that feed on electrical energy. Californian Trevor, Trevor James Constable claimed to have photographed these quote-unquote critters, as he called them, on infrared film. I've showed many of the pictures from Constable on this channel. So I just want to read that little piece here on How Stuff Works here to show you that is, this is not an original idea of mine or anything. <clears throat> but other people have this idea in the past, but have they followed it up with any sort of, you know, supporting evidence or related material or anything, sort of something that people could understand? Not much, but, you know, I try to make some points on my channel, and I will continue to do so because I think these things are animals. And they're very intelligent, probably like dolphins. We know that dolphins are extremely intelligent. And some think maybe even smarter than us. But, you know, what, what do they need a car for or anything like that? They don't. It's, you know, need, you know, is, you know, necessity is the mother of invention, right? So they don't seem to have any big pressures on them to create anything or not. But they certainly are very smart. And don't need to be any more smarter. They don't need to be smarter because they just don't need it. But when I look at some of these things, you know, to me it suggests that these things could certainly be some sort of animals that live in space. Okay, so here's UFOs with the beams of light, Foo Fighters. All this stuff. Okay. We know from, you know, like, popular mass media film, you know, they communicate by light, by sound, like, you know, close encounters of the third kind, all truth drops. Okay. The, the, um, octopus, like, Creatures in arrival, you know, or what's the truth drop there? What's, you know, what's this thing here? This is like some kind of worm in space here, right? So, or in the atmosphere. Unidentified flying worm or something like that. A larva, you know, just see what these things look like. Bugs. And they exhibit some kind of, you know, herd mentality as well. There's another close up of that thing. What is it? What are these things? Space bugs. Space animals. So I'd like to just read to you a couple little things about animals on this planet and just how amazing they are. Here here's some plankton for you right here. Isn't this interesting here? Some of the sort of regular patterns they create internally, sort of self organizing, all different types, all bioluminescent, and all these bioluminescent creatures 
And they're often referring to creatures of the deep like alien. Always saying alien like UFOs. These constant references to it from a psychological standpoint makes you think, okay, what is the connection here? And there is a connection here because these UFOs are not spaceships. They're living creatures. They have very powerful brains. They project some sort of energy fields that influence people's minds, paralyze them. They're trying to either communicate with us. Some of these things are predatory. It could be killing people, kidnapping these people. Okay. What he said about some of the creatures here on our planet is just some of the things are amazing and how complicated these, like electric eels, for example, how complicated their physiology is. You know, it's more machine-like than anything. What's going on when you read about it? Okay, I'm not going to get into it here, but you certainly should read about it. Here's one of these things, which is a biomechanoid right here on our planet, okay? Producing this type of electricity in their body, okay? It's like a machine. Okay? Their cells and everything else. How it is, it seems very alien, right? This fish. These knife fish, these electric eels, not really eels, they're fish. And it's interesting what they say about them too, and how they relate to the behavior of the UFO phenomena and what's going on with missing 411. Okay? Rending their prey helpless. You know. And having the agility of a fish, although these things are rather slow moving. But the UFOs seem to have all of these abilities. Again, back to the dragonflies I often talk about on the channel because. The dragonfly has just the ability of, it's just a complete mystery to scientists, okay? They can only speculate on how this thing is able to perform the way that it does. And when they talk about it, it's just fascinating to hear about what they say about it. You know, it just gives like a detailed analysis of it and I'm not going to read it to you, but it's all probably and maybe, and they don't know really how this thing is able to perform. And the design of his body is just so incredible. And how the wings are able to do what they do of a dragonfly is just amazes science. They only can speculate on how the thing moves, but. Well, I found this kind of interesting here. <laughs> and this is on this Islamic website here. And I just thought this is interesting what this is said in this article here. Dragonflies use movement as camouflage. Scientists are astonished from the amazing camouflage of that little insect when attacking its victim. A dragonfly is a type of insect belonging to the order of Odon Odonata. It is characterized by large multifaceted eyes, two pairs of strong transparent wings, and an elongated body. Even though dragonflies possess six legs like any other insect, they are not capable of walking. Dragonflies are valuable predators that eat mosquitoes and other small insects like flies, bees, ants, and butterflies. They are usually found around lakes, ponds, streams, and wetlands because their larvae, known as nymphs, are aquatic. In a published research by Professor Keiko Masutani of the Center of Visual Science at the Australian National University of Canberra, 
there was a proof that a dragonfly male is possessed professional in camouflaging when moving as it deludes the eye of the victim so that it sees it stable while attacking. The amazing design of wings and body enable the insect to make unlimited maneuvers while flying so, so that it can attack the victim so easily. Scientists say that dragonflies use movement for their camouflage. Camouflage is usually associated with the mobility as it occupies the same spot in the retina of the victim. So that the victim sees it stable when it's moving, scientists say that this technique is complicated and very strange. The dragonfly uses fast, complicated, and unseen movement to attack the victim. Professor Mozatani and a team used stereoscopic cameras to reconstruct the movements of the insect in three dimensions. After a long study, they discovered that this insect can arrange its wings and body during flying to make the victim see it as if it is stable. It's not moving. Most animals can skillfully conceal themselves when stationary, but they may become apparent as soon as they move. The dragonfly uses another technique, and without that it may die by hunger. But Allah Almighty taught that insect a unique technique to catch its victims. Scientists say that the brain of the dragonfly is so small in comparison with the volume of the executed complicated arithmetic operations would produce that fast movement in three directions. The eye covers the entire head and without that perfect design, dragonfly wouldn't be able to live and get its food. Nature inspired human or many inventions, but the abilities of the dragonfly are more advanced than any other superior invention. Scientists say that till now that they don't know how that insect had got these abilities to perform such complicated technique as the executed motions are amazing. Also, they say that it would be impossible for that insect to learn itself and without the help of anyone. So who taught it that technique, nature or coincidence? <clears throat> Look at the this amazing design of wings. Human can't mimic it using the latest technology methods. Who did create that perfect design? Nature or the insect itself? Atheists must answer that question. Otherwise, they should believe that Allah Almighty is the only creator or they should tell us who is the creator. And so to give some quotes from the Quran, which <coughs> you have to say to yourself, that's right. What possesses these animals to have these just amazing abilities that are far beyond ours, just far, far beyond ours? He says it in this thing here, too. After all the above, we must realize our weakness in comparison with that little insect. But we may find some people who claim that nature created this powerful insect. Allah says, or did you assign Allah partners who created the like of his creation so that the creation which they made in his creation seemed alike to them? Allah is the creator of all things. He is the one, the irresistible. <clears throat> and that's right. It's what is this energy field that gives rise that, you know, whatever God is, is some sort of field that brings forth all these things. All these things are brought forth in their own vibration in their own energy field. Otherwise the embryos wouldn't grow into certain things. They all start out the same but then they're influenced to grow into other things. Just like Rupert Sheldrake says, how is it? What shapes these things? They know what the genes do but they don't know how they do it. And a dragonfly is an amazing creature. It can accelerate at full speed instantly. It can go in any direction instantly at no harm to itself. But if something was attached to it, okay, it wouldn't be able to take the G-forces that are emitted while this thing was maneuvering. And that's how UFOs seem to operate. They're able to accelerate at full speed instantaneously. They're able to make right turns, go backwards, do, go in any direction instantly at full power. 
and many uh, research has said, well, how can anything alive survive inside that thing was traveling so fast? You know, they say they're in stasis or whatever it is. They have, you know, generate some kind of field inside the craft or whatever it may be, but I don't, you know, as, you know, Constable thought, and I think that these things are creatures, and they're not spacecraft, and they have powerful minds which can probe our minds. That's what they're like the electric eel. They're able to paralyze their prey. But in the case of beings with more advanced brains, they're able to probe our brains. And since we're trying to make sense of this probing as we're paralyzed there in bed or in our car or on a plane or in the woods or whatever, while we're paralyzed there, our mind is creating some kind of scenario that we can relate to. We don't know what they're trying to say to us because we don't understand their language. And all we feel is the probe. And our minds are trying to make sense out of it. And hence all these abduction stories. But the people were never abducted. They never went anywhere. But they were being probed by these things, maybe for hours at a time. Maybe they're able to access our minds somehow. It seems probably likely how they communicate in space. So, I just thought, and, you know, they often refer to the animals at the bottom of the ocean as being very UFO-like. Look at this thing. There's discoveries made in the ocean twilight all these creatures and they're bioluminescent. During World War II, sonar operators noticed, noted a strange phenomena. Their measurements showed that the seafloor to be 950 meters to 1,650 feet below in the daytime, but significantly higher at night. Turns out they were fooled by the superabundant lanternfish whose air-filled swim bladders reflected the sound waves. Lantern fish are tiny. They range in size from almost an inch to nearly a foot, but extremely plentiful. Found worldwide, they make up 65% of the fish biomass in the sea. They can swim in schools as large as high as a two-story house. <clears throat> More than 250 species of lantern fish have been documented above as whatever species that is, what unites them are their bioluminescent blue, green, and yellow organs known as photophores, okay? Similar to that of the midshipman fish, which reminds me of Moya. And if you look at, you know, UFOs, creatures, UFOs, shooting beams of light, here's bioluminescent organisms, Right. What do they look like? Okay, so I just thought, you know, I'd bring this up again so people would consider maybe they show rods over here. What are rods? Well, you know, think about it. These things are living things that come from space and travel to other planets that have, you know, living creatures in the atmosphere. What could they bring into our planet if they were coming in and out of our atmosphere? Things would come along with them. Little, other little creatures, whatever, they would ride along with them. You know, first you think it's a spaceship bringing them, but it's not. These creatures will have, like, fleas. And, everything. and it's not unusual. You see that in Farscape. And on Star Trek, these themes played out where bugs eat the ship, space bugs, you know. 
Again, another truth drop, space bugs. Okay. <clears throat> Giant sea creature has UFO like, you know, whatever it is. It's just a theme. Okay. So. What are these things that live in space? Space animals. They live in space. And I believe, like Constable believed, that, you know, these things are just living creatures. What they're calling zeroids here or whatever. That UFOs are just, and, you know, I showed on my channel how some of these things look like they were made in a machine shop. They look just like a spaceship, but they're not. They're living creatures that live in the environment here on our planet. So, I just bring this up again and again, because this is what I think they are, and I think this is what the answer is to Missing 411, although nobody's ever approached David Vlaitis about this, or written him a letter about it or anything, so I don't know, but maybe I'll get around to it one day. But anyway, guys, again, I hope you're interested in this concept here that maybe you never considered. I think that, you know, mainstream and history channel, and they're trying to keep this from you for some reason. This is being kept from people. Even when I did the, <clears throat> when I had the interview on um, the radio show there, um, get the name of it now, but they were surprised that Conflict Radio with uh, Mike and uh, Jared Murphy, <clears throat> they were surprised that I even brought up that concept. Here has been, you know, guys been interviewing people in ufology from all over the place for now for years and whatnot, and he's never heard about this concept. It's being left out for some reason, so... And anyway, I thought I'd bring it up again because that's what my channel is all about. These concepts that are not brought up anywhere. And I hope you thought that was interesting. And please give me a like. And if you're not a subscriber, please do subscribe because we're going to talk about it more in the future, I'm sure. All right, guys. Anyway, Bloodcat7 signing out. Peace.